Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 542, the Tuesday morning edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 15th of October, the feast of Teresa of Avila, who famously was thrown out of a cart or off a horse into a river as she tried to renew the Christian communities in Spain and was heard to say to the Lord, as she lay on her back, wriggling her legs in the water. If this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder you've got so few of us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike, welcome to the program. This is Anglican Unscripted, where the three of us sit down at least twice a week to talk about the Anglican news it's a lot of fun. You should try it. I recommend if you guys don't like what you hear from us, start your own show. But it looks like we have a growing audience and you like what you hear and like what you see. Please, if you get a chance, share the program uh, with your friends, colleagues, friends-to-be, past friends. That means enemies. Please subscribe if you're not subscribed. You do that by going to YouTube and clicking the subscribe little button. In the show notes, some people have uh, complained and said, listen, I clicked subscribe and notification, but I'm not getting it. I have a little video link in the show notes that uh, explains what YouTube is doing and how to uh, change all that. So you do get the notifications. Also, comments. You guys are the best commenters on the internet, and we appreciate that. Anytime we have a show up, you guys are quick to say, hey, I commented first. You make good points, you correct us where we're wrong, and obviously there's no corrections in the comments. We appreciate that. And you keep the conversation going. Just because we click off on the record button doesn't mean this conversation ends, and we appreciate you guys keeping it on. Kevin, the yeah. comments have an enormous impact on us. I was invited to consider the theological contents of my mugs because I was seen drinking out of a Gallic uh, independence asterisk mug and i was asked whether or not i couldn't bring some greater theological sophistication to the show so Ooh. guys here is jerusalem <laughs> the new jerusalem i can't do any better than that no that was very good um I mean, the comments are awesome uh george what I, do you got I, I wish to uh, uh <laughs> Uh, make a little bit of money here by uh, saying uh, to my diet Coke. Coca-Cola. I'm going to teach the world to sing I am. So please keep the comments up. We read all the comments. Uh, we don't reply to all the comments because we're busy people, but that's, th that's the way it works. Um, let's see. Gavin, that is not England you are in, is it? No, it, it, it's Normandy. And, um, uh, and on my way down, I, I had a Teresa of Avila experience because I had set off into a huge rainstorm on my motorbike and I thought actually I'm a bit old for this and suddenly the oil pressure gauge went on but I knew I had enough oil because for, for reasons I won't bother people with so I turned around went back to my mechanics in my village and they said you have an electrical fault you will need to leave your motorbike here while we strip it to pieces and I said please will you please will you not make this very expensive and they looked at me with sorrow in their eyes as I walked out into the rain to ask my wife if I could please be allowed to have the car and leave her without any transport for a week. And um, she was very gracious, and here I am. <laughs> so it's been, it's been uh, um, on, on, the, on the, the plus side, I was saved from having to ride in a really nasty rainstorm for four hours. O on the minus side, well, the minus side is obvious. Pray for the bike and the mechanics. <laughs> yes. What year is your motorcycle, Gavin? It's about 11 years old. Well, I, I just mentioned that uh, BMW has a terrible reputation for quality that's arisen in the past 10, 15 years. I happen to know a little bit about the car side. And folks, don't buy BMWs. Don't <laughs> buy Mercedes. Seriously, do not no, buy them. No, you're right. Down. They've yeah. gone down. You, if you open the hood of these new, the Mercedes, uh, the S-Class right now in the United States sell for about $120,000. You open the hood, three quarters of the stuff is now plastic. Yeah. It, and that will crack. If you live in Texas and in Florida, you're going to be buying a new engine within three or four years. Well, I, I exaggerating, but still the quality. And I hate to say this because it goes against everything I've ever said, but buy a Japanese motorcycle. They really do. They, the quality Japanese motorbikes when I were young were junk. They're junk. 
And if you wanted to be a hot rodder, you bought a BSA or something exotic, but you knew you'd be, it was a money pit. And American Harley Davidsons were the top of the line. And But now the Japanese bikes, the quality that they have over the last 25 years can't be beat. No. George, as soon as the Lord stimulates someone to give me 5,000 pounds, I will take your advice. <laughs> I recognize so, <laughs> good advice when I hear it. <laughs> I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Motorcycles Unscripted. No, um, ah! it's, inter <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, another car update. As people may know, September 11th, I had a head-on with a car and my mm. bicycle. The bicycle was bent and destroyed. My body was hurt. My helmet was crushed. The insurance company has finally settled, and they're going to buy me a new bike. Yay! They're still going to let their driver drive on the roads, but I can't. I can't stop that. Uh, he was cited, so I, it's a happy outcome with an insurance company. I, I know that doesn't happen very often, so that was good news, gentlemen. We should move on to the news. I don't know if you've been paying attention. There's something called the Amazon Synod going on with uh, Pope Francis and all the Roman Catholics, and I thought the Anglicans were crazy. I thought we were just way out in left field. I thought the Episcopal Church was crazy. I'm seeing all the craziness being repeated now in the Roman Catholic Synod. And I thought we could talk about this. Um, George, what's the latest updates? Well, what is fascinating to me is the comments made by the Synod Fathers, the bishops and the leaders of the Synod, um, from the podium and the dais as they have their discussions and uh, interventions. And some of the things that we've learned are quite extraordinary. I did not know, for instance, that nuns in some Brazilian dioceses uh, give, hear confessions and give absolutions or are permitted to marry people using the, the rites of the Catholic Church. I did not know that in one Brazilian diocese, women are training alongside men in the diaconate training program. And the bishop said, I'm just waiting for the word. All I need is an oral word from Pope Francis and they will be ordained as deacons. And we heard another uh, discussion about uh, infanticide. Some Indian tribes uh, in the Amazon region practice the exposing of children born with birth defects, cleft palate, Down syndrome, what have you. And the Catholic Church at one time, in, in many places, has taught the people that all life is sacred, you may not do this. There are other dioceses, however, with the sanction of the bishop who basically r rise raise the indigenous primitive culture above the eternal truths uh, contained in the Bible, that we cannot impose our Western mindset that all life is sacred on these Indian tribes. Now, these are not universal truths. In other words, your neighboring Catholic church does not have people exposing babies and women deacons and nuns marrying people. But the Catholic church in portions of Amazonia is living out the, I'll, I'll use a pejorative term, the excesses of 1970s secular liberation theology. Mm -hmm. um, what we saw in the Episcopal Church and is now mainstream in the Episcopal Church in some parts of Brazil is mainstream Catholicism. And again, this is not a universal truth taught across the across the catholic church but it's permitted either by uh, omission or in some certain sense cases yes we've been given verbal approval to do that and the fear that some catholic traditionalists are voicing is that when when you allow the the, the amazon synod is being basically run by the german and the austrian bishops and missionaries and this is the mindset of the German church, which is the wealthiest church because of church taxes and history and so on. And they're in the driver's seat. And, they're, and the fear is that Francis will appoint like-minded cardinals uh, and more German and Brazilian and liberation theology cardinals so that when he goes, his successor will continue Francis's mm -hmm. policy of opening up the church to make it an image of the Episcopal church. I know that sounds silly and people will go, how could that, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But if you just look at where Francis and the Germans are going, Cardinal Walter Casper and whatnot, mm. it is the same arc, the same trajectory. 
that the Episcopal Church and the Anglican world started in the late in the mid 1970s. And, well, and that, this is where we are today. Kevin? No, go ahead, Kevin. I, 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 I was going to introduce the next section with uh, Pope Francis's uh, public relations, but, but why don't you cover it? Oh, oh good. No, no, I think I'd like to continue what George was saying and yeah. to try and put it in, to expand upon the theological analysis that he offered, because uh, um, he's quite right. I, I, the, um, there's an interesting distinction between the Eastern and Western Christianity. So Eastern Christianity, the Orthodox, say the roots of our authenticity are, are the Bible and the, and the Church of the Apostles. And if you want to have the most authentic liturgy you can, you have the most primitive one. You go for the liturgy of St. James. You, go, you stick as close to the Apostles as you can. In a sense, this is very close to the Protestant um, priority of, of sticking as close as possible to Scripture. My, my difficulty with with Protestantism is that it reads the scriptures through a lens of the 17th century. And I think that, you know, you then miss out one and a half thousand years of things the Holy Spirit's been saying. But that's another argument. The problem with both the Catholicism and Episcopalianism in the West is, particularly those with intellectual traditions, is that rationalism takes a grip. And the idea of progress has set in, that we can make things better as they develop. Newman said, uh, that, that in human life we want you to change and change often. But of course the change he was talking about was transformation, not progress. And that I think is the difference, the, the, if you like, the rock that the Western church, Catholic or Protestant, is foundering on. Uh, there are two kinds of change. One is transformation and holiness, and the other is secular improvements. And I think one of the best commentaries I've seen in on the phenomenon that George has been describing is that um, certainly in Episcopalianism, but in Catholicism too, Francis is an example of a, of a, 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 a bandwidth of 20 or 30 years of elderly men who grew up in the 60s and 70s who were completely taken in by the myth of progress and sort of Vatican II in, in, a, in an in intensified style. And they want to impose it before the traditionalists were coming along behind them uh, who have not been so seduced by it, grow up and become bishops themselves. And for the Catholic Church, the crisis is how many bishops of like-minded liberalism sold into the secular progress project can Francis uh, uh, um, produce as cardinals so that his successor is in his mold. The really interesting and important thing is going to be who succeeds Francis. Another, an, another baby boomer from the 60s sold on semi-Marxian utopianism or someone committed to biblical and apostolic Christianity. The fate of Catholicism hangs on that choice. The trouble with, with Episcopalianism is that choice has been made and, and rooted into the DNA of, both, of Anglicanism already in a way that can't be changed, I don't think. In, in, Ang in Episcopalianism, the, uh, I speak now to the circumstances in my diocese. The younger the clergy, the more traditionally minded they are. That's the Catholic model too, and unfortunately, the to get get ahead, you basically have to give in or give up some of your principles. Sell if you want to be moral, is that what we're saying? <laughs> well, it's not it's not counted in that way, but it's either said. Well, it's sort of cloaked in. Well, as you mature and as you realize that uh, there are two sides to every coin, we've all heard these arguments. It's not na very rarely is it naked ambition. That's basically what people do to become bishops to sell out. Uh, but the people start out with a traditional worldview and mindset and find that it's better to get along, to go along. You can maintain in your own little parish your own worldview, but to survive in the jungle of the wider church with the, the heights, if you will, the hierarchy firmly in the hands of the left, you have to keep quiet or go along to get along. Otherwise, and the, and the Otherwise, and, you suffer the fate of Keith Ackerman and you get kicked out for no good reason. I'm sure that's true. And, and if and anyone doubts what the end result is, it's syncretism. It is the merging of Christianity as, a, as, a, as, as one religion amongst others without any distinction between good and evil. And if, if, you know, one of the great gifts of the Holy Spirit and, 
uh, and, and the perspective of, of John's gospel in particular, all the gospels, but John in particular is in order to progress in the Christian life, you need to be able to tell the difference between good and evil. You're in a spiritual struggle. The problem with the syncretists is that they've abandoned that completely. It is the most terrible treachery and a great evacuation of integrity out of Christianity. I remember years ago when Rowan Williams was in office, first in office, the press office would uh, every once in a while have to issue a correction. That's not what Rowan meant. Okay. <laughs> then Justin came to office, and, uh, and when Justin was the Archbishop of Canterbury, very frequently the first two months, six months, that's not what Justin meant. This is what he meant. When we saw the Pope on the plate, what's that? Okay. Whoa. The difference is. Yeah. Rowan Williams <laughs> knew what he was talking That's about. Right. <laughs> it wasn't that he misspoke, but that he spoke in such a fog that Let's you clarify. had no clue. Whereas Justin would make would go down and go down an alley, and then uh, realize it's a dead end and he'd back up. He wouldn't. Yeah. No, if only <laughs> if only he realized they were dead ends. I'm it's not sure ends. that's true. I'm sorry to be mean, but but my estimation. Why well, we shouldn't. It's difficult, isn't it, both to tell the truth and not to avoid speaking badly of people. Um, if, if only Justin realized how many of his theological inquiries were dead ends, that would be a good thing. Is that a better way of saying it? Now, I remember the images of the press corps on the back of the, the, the Pope plane, and the Pope would come back, and they would hold up a microphone to him. Oh, it's so cool. He's going to talk to us on the plane. And then... Hours later, uh, Rome uh, or the Vatican uh, press office is releasing statements saying he didn't mean that. This is what he meant. He didn't mean this. No, no, no. You're the you know, and they would correct you and 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 um, as press and say, "Gosh, you don't take him so literally." Well, now we're finding there's you know, even years later, Pope still has problems with reporters and press. Either the reporters aren't hearing him clearly, or they hear him so clearly that it's not worth reporting on. George, what's the latest example? La Repubblica, which is a major Italian newspaper, it's on the left side. Its editor, Eugene uh, Scalafini, Scalafari, I've, I've mangled his name. Yeah, he's in, his, he's in his 90s. He's a very prominent journalist. This is not some hack. This is a he's major not a wacko. He's, he's real, this is a real. major person of consequence within the cultural, intellectual life of Italy. He has formed a very good working relationship with Francis and over the past five, six years has published a number of interviews with Francis. Now, Scalafini does not record the interviews. He rewrites them from memory and they're presented in opinion articles. And he will say, and Pope Francis told me X which are not being put forward as word for word, but this is the substance of what Francis said. Some of the things that Francis is, is alleged to have said is that there's no difference between a good Christian and a good communist. They both have morality at the base of what they're thinking. And uh, you know that, that was explained away by the Vatican press office. No, this is what he meant. The latest of these things, and there have been five or six of these over the years, is that Jesus is not God. He's not fully God. He's a man. And he's a good man. He's a great man. He's a wise man. He's an exemplar, but he is not God. Now, the Vatican responded first with a uh, rather lukewarm, well, this is an old man who doesn't record these things, and it doesn't capture quite the essence of what Francis said. And then a more robust rejection was released the next day by the press office saying, well, this is not what Francis, Francis didn't say it in that way. And you're left with two impressions. One, that Scalafini is wrong. But two, Francis has never said that Scalafini is wrong. It's always his surrogates. And it's always that Scalafini is, is misinterpreting mm. what Francis says. Now, Francis' defenders would say, well, the Pope will then go on to celebrate Mass and say the Nicene Creed. Therefore, he must believe that Jesus is fully human and fully divine and all this and that. Friends, I've worshipped with Jack Spong. Yeah, Jack so. Spong didn't believe Jesus was a man. He didn't believe in heaven and hell. He didn't believe in anything. But he was a good Episcopal bishop, and he recited the words of the creeds. Praying does not mean believing. That's one of the mantras of Episcopalianism. <laughs> 
And we have seen Episcopal clergy who do not believe in any of these things earn their dollar by going to church on Sunday and reciting the creeds and the services. Okay, George, I was with you right up to the end, but I think the lex orandi is lex credendi in the sense that the liturgy does tell us what we believe. So if, for example, you have a denomination that begins to start liturgies of gay blessing, that's what they believe, whether you change the canon law or not. So I think we have to distinguish, I think, between between the, the liturgy which expresses the belief of the church and then what you're talking about which is more problematic which you, what Elizabeth I would not do which is to open a window on men's souls by peering into what they believe perhaps with the Pope you're entitled to open a window in his soul to ask what he believes well the, the two things one I do not agree that Lex Arandi is Lex Credendi because that is particular uh, neurological, sociological worldview that language shapes thought. I believe that thought precedes language. So I reject that concept, but that's not really what, that was the point that I was trying to make. This is awesome. This will be our discussion what I, today. What the point that I was trying to make is just because you say the prayers doesn't mean you believe the prayers. And no, that's the Francis is that he says the prayers and gives the sermons. That does not mean he believes what he says. Okay, but we're, we're, we're talking about, you're right, we're talking about different things, though. You, you, know, you, you are still talking about the integrity of the individual as he adopts the liturgy, and you're saying you cannot assume integrity for the individual just because he says the liturgy, and I agree with you. However, um, in terms of, of, of whether thought or words precede one another, I don't think that's what Lex Credendi, Lex Randi really is, is about. What it's really saying is, um, if you want to know what the church believes, watch how it prays, because that's how its belief is contained. It's, it's institutional belief, not individual belief. So we're, we're, we're discussing how institutional integrity works as opposed to individual existentialism. But I, and, and as whether or not the, the argument about language and words is summed up by Wittgenstein. Of course, I don't. I know you know more about Wittgenstein than I do, so I'm not trying to to show off here. But I mean, early Wittgenstein suggested there was a degree of objectivity about language, which dominated the way in which discourse took place. And, and late Wittgenstein is the is the problem we all face, which is that um, the the meaning gets gets formed by the way in which people choose to use words, and that down that yeah. route, of course, lies Lex all the relativism that we... Okay. I'm coming at it from a different perspective. Uh, Lex Arandi, Lex Credende is a late 19th century Anglican fad. You go to Ripon College, Cuttison, it's across the arch as you walk in. It is a creation of the late 19th century Anglican worldview, which we then thought to, okay, let's take this little mantra of progressive Anglicanism, the Anglicanism that thought that uh, things will get better and better and better. We're in a pro progressive world that will always be getting better because intellectual life is, is evolving. Let's take this idea, which is foreign to anything before the 19th century, and then let's reinterpret everything in behind us with this, with this phrase. Now, I'm not saying that lit I'm not disagreeing with you in saying that liturgy does express the corporate identity, the corporate vision. But what I'm trying to say is that the language of liturgy is only a tool. It is not the reality of faith or belief or God. It is a it is a feeble attempt in compared to the greatness and magnitude of the divine to try to articulate what we're trying to say. But I don't okay. think that an, but I don't think that it is a solid guard or guideline to I, I agree it's not a solid guard or guideline. I accept you're quite right to put it in its cultural context. I think if we were having a more extended discussion, one of the things I've become much more grateful for in my praying life is liturgy. Um, this, this is a different conversation, of course. I mean, I, I accept the point you made. But I think the great virtue of liturgy, particularly as against no liturgy, is that you get to ride on the shoulders of, if you like, of, of the whole church. You get carried by the faith of the church. You enter into something much bigger than yourself, which is enormously valuable. So we're, we're talking about different uses of the, of the liturgy, different functions for it. I can see that you're quite right to call 
progressive 19th century Anglicans to account for the card trick they're trying to play on us. It's interesting because you're both right in this. Kevin's guide is you can tell what a person believes by what they do. Not what they say, not what they pray, not what they read, but what they do. And uh, uh, in as much, you are both right. Uh, yes, I think we're both right too. Yeah, it's, yep. a, it, it's an <laughs> Anglican challenge if, if ever well, there was one. If I, if I may have a personal uh, moment of spite, the bane of my existence are liturgy fairies. Uh, <laughs> the, the nastiest, meanest group of Christians you will ever meet are liturgy experts. These people who fight over commas and clauses and do we add or subtract the filioque clause and all this and that. To me, that is, I don't want to say it's pointless. It's rather interesting. And I'm sure our church taxes go to keep these men happy. But, oh, I just have... George. George, you're, you're so good until you just step over the line. You were fine until you brought the filioque in. That, 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 that's really important. It was great. Every, if you could just say that all again and leave out the filioque, I'd agree with every word. That'll be a different that... show. That'll be a different show. <laughs> where, where I will, I I don't... will take, I will take uh, the uh, Anglican, I will take the Anglican divines through Karl Barton saying, if you don't say the filioque, you're not a Christian. Whereas you can take the Eastern approach and say, if you say the filioque way, you're not a Christian. So. I, would, I would just say that if you change the creed without an ecumenical council, just because a Spanish Visigoth king can't argue his case for orthodoxy, you know, the ends don't justify the means. <laughs> there we are. That's the I condensed argument. Knows. We're going to have a long so we'll talk, uh, talk in the future. <laughs> Um, and another, another talk on uh, Lexer on the Lex point, I, I do want to raise Gavin's point about the ends justifying the means is the public face of the Amazon Synod. Hmm. For instance, one of the big issues is that we need married men to be priests because we don't hmm. have enough celibate men to be priests. And the argument that they're engaging in this week is the Latin phrase very probati, that married men need a special supplementary verification. They need a certificate of virtue in order to be allowed to become priests. Now, the, the logical converse of that is that celibate men don't need a special verification of virtue, that celibate men are ipso facto virtuous, married men are ipso, are, are non-virtuous unless proven otherwise. And the pragmatic like response is and that the public face is the pragmatic response is that well we're going to make this exception and this exception and this exception but still the gold standard is a celibate married celibate male priest i think i just like to add an addendum it's just a piece of my own thinking which which, which nobody else may agree with but i found it resonated in in tom holland's book dominion which i'm still working my way through and it'll take me a while it's quite thick one of the things that, that Holland says, which amplifies my own thinking, is the extraordinary way in which Christianity managed to change sexual culture away from what the Romans and the pagans and the Greeks did. If you like, there were three great cultural blocks, paganism, Greek culture and Roman culture, and they were all pretty lascivious when it came to sex. And one of the things that Christianity did in the most amazing way was to reconfigure sexual morals in a way, particularly the protected women, uh, and which is which is why the whole feminist beef about patriarchal Christianity is so misinformed. And I, I think what that does is it puts celibacy into a slightly different light. It means it's the 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 treasuring of celibacy in Catholic terms is a is a price you might pay in order to achieve some kind of some kind of bulwark against pagan sexuality. Um, and one of the things we've discovered in our lifetimes in the last 30 years is that dam has now burst. That, that bulwark that Christianity managed to put up between, if you like, the Freudian natural instinct uh, and, uh, and, and the managing of our sexuality, that burst. Um, and the danger is that if we sweep away celibacy or we discount celibacy, just at a moment of, of critical weakness in our struggle with pagan sexuality, that might be a shame. What a great point for a transition. This is really cool that you guys just, here Kevin, transition time. 
Well, the pagans have taken over <laughs> down under, George, and I thought you could uh, give us a little update on uh, the Diocese of Perth and what's been going on uh, recently down under. Our friend David Old, who's a contributor to this uh, show from time to time, has published a neat little article on his web page, and we've reprinted it on Anglican Inc., uh, pointing out that the uh, Diocese of Perth has uh, re re changed their clergy... Uh, uh, moral standards clause, uh, loosening it so that you can, it used to be that clergy may not engage in sexual relations outside of marriage. Uh, now that's been dropped and they can basically do what they want to do. Uh, they can go to Las Vegas this weekend if they want to, It'd be perfectly good, good about it. What stays so, in Vegas, but, but, what happens in Vegas stays we, in Vegas. We, we see the, uh, Years ago, when I was in seminary, uh, we, uh, the Society of St. John the Evangelist uh, has its house up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there was one in London next to uh, Westminster Abbey, but they closed. Mm. They were different, same, same group, but they were so mm. different as to be different people. The one in England was traditionalist. The one in America is very liberal. And I uh, heard a talk by one of their... Uh, one of the leaders basically explained to me that chastity does not mean refraining from sexual relations. It means if you're married, only having sexual relations with your wife. And if, if you're unmarried, it means being uh, not being uh, promiscuous. But you could, and a gay man could, ha could engage in uh, sexual relations to his heart's content and still be chaste. And these are, you know, Here's the, this is back to our language question that the mm. SSJE managed to change the meaning of chastity uh, to allow uh, same sex relations. The but the, the the motivation for it, it it's the same pattern, isn't it? It's syncretism. It it it's the abandonment of distinctive Christian virtue in order to buy in to our system, other systems of values. I mean, and every time we see that happening, well, I mean, it's sold to us the name of progress, but it's the same principle every time, the abandonment of authentic Christian virtue. And the Diocese of Perth has basically softened its explicit language about extramarital sexual relations, getting rid of that, and is now going down the SSJE road to change what words used to mean. Chastity no longer means what we thought it mm -hmm. meant. Celibacy may not mean, well, celibacy is really hard to change, but chastity isn't hard to change. Well, you would have thought that marriage was hard to change, but they managed to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we want to bring you some news. Uh, I think like two or three episodes ago, George and I talked about the bloggers, uh, and we, we tried to name some. Long before uh, Anglican TV, there were blogs, Connecticut 6, Titus 1.9, Stand Firm, uh, Virtue Online, and there was also Baby Blue. And I'm, I, I probably have only named a tenth of the blogs that existed uh, when the Episcopal Church was so crazy uh, 10 years ago. And uh, Baby Blue was run by Mary Ailes. She was a uh, very wonderful communication uh, person, and she was a, a wonderful blogger. She was a big Bob Dylan fan. Uh, she passed away yesterday from cancer, and we wanted to uh, uh, pay mm -hmm. tribute and thank her for all her contributions. Uh, she most recently was the communications person for uh, uh, Guernsey's diocese, uh, Di Mid Atlantic. Mid Atlantic. Yeah. So gonna miss her. She was she was a good one. All right. Is that it for the news, guys? I'm looking at my notes. Hold that one second. I have here written down Tim Dakin. You want to talk about that? Or yes. Not? <laughs> yes. How so much time have we got? We got. Uh, it's, we, we've gone what? Thirty-three minutes in. If you can do Tim in five minutes, we'll be good. I have skin in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. We'll give the background too. We don't just give the update, but uh, we we should give background. Okay. Because we have a lot of new viewers to the program. Why is it news Ten. today? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's news today because the Archbishop of Canterbury set up a commission to look, out, to, 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 to look at the way forward for the Channel Islands after they had fallen out irreparably with the Diocese of Winchester. And the commission has reported under Richard Charters, who's a splendid man, 
a man I admire in many ways, and they've suggested that the way forward will be for the Channel Islands not to become a diocese of their own, not to join the Diocese of Europe, not to join the Diocese of Canterbury, but instead to go back where they, where they arrived on their second stage as they left the Diocese of Coutances, where I am now, in fact, um, and join with the Diocese of Salisbury. So the Channel Islands will become part of the Diocese of Salisbury. And as a news item, that might not seem very exciting. But the reason I have skin in the game is because 10 weeks after I moved to Jersey, and I even wondered whether or not it was the Lord's intention to, to, to put me in this position, the Bishop of Winchester, Tim Dakin, who I knew a little, fired the Dean of Jersey, uh, whom I didn't know at all, and I had just arrived there. A short, uh, shortly afterwards, the, the, lay, the laity, the lay deanery, it's kind of like a, like a diocesan synod, but it was a deanery, uh, sent me to, to, to the Archbishop, Justin had just been consecrated, with a letter commissioning me to negotiate on behalf of the laity. I knew some of the people in the Archbishop's office. I arrived and I said to, the, I said to them, this could be an enormously expensive and problematic scandal. I think you don't realize the, what you started, but look, here is a solution by which everyone can emerge with their dignity intact and we can move towards uh, um, finding a way forward without anyone losing face. And the archbishop's chief right-hand man looked at me and said, Gavin, F off. Only he didn't say F. <laughs> he said, F off. He said, oh, yeah. he said, F off back to Jersey. And I looked at him in astonishment because people on the whole in the church circles I work in don't speak like that. Um, and I was astonished. And I said, I, I don't think you know what you're doing uh, at every level. So I did go back to Jersey. And then what's happened this week is the outcome of it. The problem was, the, 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 the briefest of backgrounds is there was a, a, a problematic church warden who hugged a, a lady who lived in his house in a way he should not have hugged her. Um, she was not a very well person. Most adults are vulnerable. She was particularly vulnerable. It was complicated by the fact that she'd lived with two other church families on the mainland, and this had happened twice before. So there's problems on both sides of the equation. She went to the dean and made a complaint, not unreasonably, against the church warden. Uh, and the dean uh, invited her to, to, to follow certain protocol. She refused, and when the dean said he couldn't handle it without the protocol being followed, she made a complaint against the dean. This is not earth-shattering stuff, except that the Bishop of Winchester appeared to him waiting for a moment like this because he then executed the dean professionally. Now, there is a protocol which says in safeguarding issues, you can suspend without any sense of blame, but to suspend the administrator um, on the basis that he had simply rehearsed the rules, which appeared to be the case, was an overreaction. However, you just quote the word safeguarding and you're allowed to overreact in all kinds of ways nowadays. The problem was then that, that then the bishop produced a report by a psychotherapist. When I read this report, uh, I thought it was a complete fabrication. I, I thought it was a hatchet job. Somebody had paid or influenced or, or, or done something to the... Um, <laughs> to the <laughs> Keep talking, you will get your audio. <laughs> to, 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 to a psychotherapist, uh, it appeared to me to produce a report that was simply so much less than the truth that I was astonished by it. I read this. The bishop then had promised to discuss the report with the dean before he published it, but he put it on the internet that day. Um, and if ever there was a safeguarding issue, a bishop putting a private report that uh, disclosed the private life of a vulnerable adult is is the worst safeguarding issue in the whole narrative so far. Um, I can do this in the dark, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, I, I, well, in case case. in case some of our viewers have epilepsy, I uh, decided to. to <laughs> it's not flashing, yes. Feed, you, <laughs> but the audio so, so to bring the, to bring the thing to its conclusion as quickly as possible, the the the, the bishop refused. The bishop then set up a high court judges commission, and it looked as though he was trying to get the dean by another route. He promised he would publicize the, ju the judge's report. When the judge's report came through, her name was Dame Heather Steele. He refused to publish it. I think he refused to publish it because it said critical things about him. 
even though he had even though he had made a solemn promise to the government of, of Jersey, to the dean of Jersey, to the people of the, the, the deanery, he broke that promise. Now, uh, at this point, the people of Jersey lost all faith in the Bishop of Winchester because they believed he had not told the truth. He had overreacted uh, to make an example of the dean when that was a wholly improper thing to do. And when invited to put the thing right, he had sought to... Uh, to develop the thing in a worse way. Um, and at that point, the deanery said, we, we repudiate him. We're not having anything to do with a, with, a, with a man who pretends to be a Christian in, this, in these terms, even if he is a bishop. And at that point, they stopped paying their money. <laughs> and money is what changes things in the church. And uh, the, the solution was that a number of us said, if you give us different Episcopal oversight, a different diocese, everything can calm down and we then expect you to look into this and to hold the Bishop of Winchester accountable for what he's done. They moved them to the Diocese of Canterbury and Trevor Wilmot did a very good job indeed of simply pouring oil on waters and finally the Archbishop released his commission which looked into it. Instead of holding the Bishop of Winchester accountable for breaking 500 years of history and for being less than straightforward with the truth, They've, they've swept it under a verbose carpet. The evidence in the commissioner's report is there that the fault lay with the Bishop of Winchester, but they won't tell the truth. And one of the reasons this matter was, halfway through, Charters says, you know, we're Christians, and a number of people have made representations to this commission that as Christians, we should be able to heal a broken relationship between a bishop and his people. But this one, Charters says, it's too badly broken. Now, at that point, it seems to me he's under a moral duty to explain why it's too badly broken. But to do so would be to tell the unvarnished truth about Tim Dakin, which they refuse to do. And, we're, and, and George may want to continue the conversation at this point, because it seems to me you can say anything you like about dead bishops and they have got no comeback. But, but, but hold any live bishop to account for serious misbehavior and you can whistle. Well, it's important well, that when you said the dead bishops, you can say anything bad about dead bishops. When you're found wrong, they don't re they don't repent. You know, Justin uh, certainly said some bad things uh, about a dead bishop. Had an investigation. The police said, Justin, you're wrong. Lambeth, you need to drop this. There's just no evidence here. We've interviewed this person. It's not there, and nobody says they're sorry. That's the experience we have. On, on top of the local issue of the conflict between the dean and the bishop and the deanery and the island, we have the issue of a failure at the top of the Church of England in that one of the things that has come out in this whole Smythe and sexual abuse scandal is that a, uh, over a dozen bishops have had uh, complaints brought against them. And not one, not one has been acted upon. Now, here we have an example of a bishop who's alleged to have lied. This is a Charles, in other words, this is someone who's on the, as a Charles Benison type bishop for our Episcopal viewers. Uh, someone whose conduct is, is unbecoming of a member, member of the ministry. Uh, we're not talking about great theological issues here. We're talking about someone who's allegedly a scoundrel, who should not be exercising Episcopal ministry according to biblical standards of what a bishop should do. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has protected Tim Dakin, uh, sabotaging any attempt to bring him to justice, instead trying to, uh, as he has every other bishop. Now, the exceptions are George Bell, who was sacrificed, his, his reputation, his integrity was sacrificed when the sexual abuse scandals first came out so that the Church of England could be do, seen to be doing something. Well, it's been... I would say almost conclusively proven that this was all uh, false, and yet the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Chichester, is it not, has refused to uh, back down from the condemnation of George Bell. And then we have the case of the Bishop of Lincoln this past year, who is such a danger to children, has to, he has to be removed from office. But there's no we know nothing about this and we at the same time we're told he's not a danger to anybody but 
at the same time, he's treated as if he were uh, Hannibal Lecter, who must be restrained from killing and eating people. So what we're having is that we're having public executions of, of disposable people. Then we're having the private protection of people like Tim Dakin, who was uh, part of that evangelical party, if you will, surrounding the Archbishop of Canterbury, but an evangelical who goes along to get along with the secular worldview of the institutional church. He is protected, as it appears to me, an outsider. While a dead man and a liberal Catholic, who is basically not of any use to anybody, can be satisfied for public relations purposes, sacrificed for public relations purposes. On a personal note, uh, before I did anything in public, I went to see Tim Dakin. And I said, look, this is what we have against you. And here again, I think, is how we can be reconciled and find a way through. You need to say sorry. Uh, and we can find a form of reconciliation based on everyone acknowledging that mistakes have been made. He, he gave me a particular look, which I won't describe, and said, I'll see you off. And so we kind of looked into each other's eyes for a while. I forget which one of us blinked, but that wasn't the point. The, there was no attempt to implement Christian behavior from his side. And I, I, I think the difficulty I have is, you know, one of the reasons why we're quite cross with the ecologists, the extinction extremists, is because we say, well, it's no good you messing up London and then going on expensive holidays or taking flights. Or if, if what you say with your mouth is so far removed from what you do with your life, you, have a, you can't expect people to believe you. And the problem with this commission's report by not telling the truth is that anything the Anglican Church says, the Church of England says, about reconciliation, and it is well bis mot juste. He never stops using it. But, but the rhetoric is so far distant from the behavior that it brings the whole practice of the faith into very serious disrepute. And the problem is we're all sinners. We cannot afford to have that level of institutional hypocrisy if we're going to convince the world and be faithful to Jesus. The Archbishop of Canterbury can apologize, apologize to the Sikhs for the Amritsar massacre that happened 100 years ago yet he is unable to apologize or unwilling to apologize or acknowledge the hurt of the Smythe victims in his own lifetime. He's been not, he, he has allegedly been aware of this since 2012. We're going on eight, nine years now uh, of his having actual knowledge of the abuse of people who he knows, some of whom are in the ministry with him, and yet we see nothing. We see these pious actions, public statements, apologizing for colonialism, apologizing for the British Empire's policing actions. But when it's actual, but when those apologies actually count to living victims, how, how long has Smythe been public? Uh, and how long have the victims been out there? And what do we have? We, we have nothing. These poor men have been abused once by Smythe and we've alleged by other clergy, and now they're being abused a second time by the Church of England's institutional op operating standards. Like we said at the beginning of the program, Rome, the Episcopal Church, and the Anglican Communion are all crazy, acting the same. Not much different between them in 2019. Well, that was a good show. Uh, Gavin, are you traveling Friday? Are you going to be able to record with us? What's your uh, oh, I'm going down to Shoreham by sea to lead an, uh, a weekend for the Free Church of England there. And I will be traveling on Friday. Okay. Um, we, better, we better discuss this. Yeah, Kevin, you're I'm, not I'm, going I'm, to the Shoreham nuclear reactor, are you? No, I will no, not no. be there this weekend. No, no, no. no, no. We, we, you can join Greta there. And, uh, <laughs> That's uh, right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to take a sailboat if I do. Yeah, uh, yeah. the environmentalist activists. They are not Lex Lorende, Lex Cordenze, that's for sure. Guys, it's been a great show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we're agreed. No syncretism, lots of repentance. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 542.